Today is January the 5th, 2020, and the name of our lesson today is Who Can Be Saved in the Tribulation Period and Will the Holy Spirit Be Gone? And the reason I'm teaching this lesson today is because last week and the week before we had questions that kind of caused us to get off the beaten path of where we're supposed to be in Numbers and Deuteronomy, but that's good. That's good because questions cause us to search for answers, and hopefully you're searching in the Word of God for answers. So that's what we're going to do today. And for this quarter, we, we may be off, off the beaten path the whole quarter. I'm not sure it's according to what other kind of questions come up. But open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to encourage everyone in the class and everyone that's listening by YouTube to get your pencils, your papers, and take notes. Take notes, write down scriptures, go back and look it up, because if you really want to learn the Word of God, that's how you're going to have to do it. I'm just putting a little bit out here to get you started, but you're going to have to be the one to search the scriptures, because God's not just going to lay it on you. He wants you to seek Him. He wants you to seek the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. God wants you to love His ways enough to look for His ways. So you're going to have to search it for yourself. I'm just giving you a little start here. All right, question one that we had is, if the church has gone up in the rapture, is the Holy Spirit gone as well? Question number two is, if a person has heard the gospel in the church age, can they still be saved in the tribulation? And those are good questions. Both questions come up, I think, because of Second Thessalonians 2, uh, where in verse 3 it says, before the man of sin is revealed, there will be a falling away. People have taken that falling away to mean the rapture, because the word does mean a departure. But falling away in the verse could mean a departure from the faith or apostasy, getting away from the teachings of God, which we certainly have in our day and age. Then in verse 7, it says, Only he who now letteth will let, that means prevents or hinders, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So people have interpreted the he to be the Holy Spirit. And they've used these verses to say that when the rapture happens, the Holy Spirit will be gone from the earth and then the Antichrist will be revealed. Well, they're partly right. I agree the he who now letteth will let is God or the Holy Spirit. Letteth means prevent. So God holds back Satan for now. But the next he until he be taken out of the way, I think is probably not the Holy Spirit. I'll show you why by comparing Scripture with Scripture. But as I always say, be like the Bereans who search the Scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul taught them was so. Search the Scriptures to see whether the things Pam teaches you is so. I may be wrong. I don't think so. I wouldn't be teaching it like this, but I could be. Now, first of all, the scriptures show that the Holy Spirit, scriptures, comparing scriptures with scriptures, show that the Holy Spirit is never, never taken away from anywhere except from a man's body in the Old Testament. Judges 16.20 regarding Samson, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. First Samuel 16.14, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And then in Psalms 51.11, David prayed, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Spirit departed people's body in the Old Testament. He wasn't active in Samson's or Saul's body anymore for a while, but he was still active in the world. 
I don't know if he has ever active in Saul's body again, but he, he did become active in Samson's. But anyway, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent like God because he is God and is always everywhere. Jeremiah twenty three twenty four. Can I can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth? Saith the Lord. So if the Lord fills the heaven and earth, the Holy Spirit does too. Psalms one hundred and thirty nine seven and eight. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Revelation eleven eleven, the spirit of life from God entered them, speaking of Moses and Elijah during the tribulation period. So we see the spirit was active on earth even in the tribulation period. Now later on I'll show you how the Holy Spirit um, is very, very active during the tribulation in a big, big way because multitudes get saved. But question two, regarding, okay, those who have heard the gospel during the church age and refuse to get saved, will they be able to be saved during the tribulation period? From the scriptures I've searched, the answer to that is a big, big yes. I think the misconceptions people have about both of those questions come from the same passage of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians, myself included. I used to think that way too. Um, I used to think that, oh no, if you heard the gospel in the church age, you can't be saved in the tribulation. And uh, the other question, what was the other question I've already forgot? Uh, let's see, the other question. If the church has gone up, will the Holy Spirit go up as well? Okay, the two questions. Kind of pretty well connected. <laughs> okay. So I used to think that, that the answer to that was, no, no, can't be saved. The Holy Spirit's gone. So Paul had been in Thessalonica for two to three weeks and started some churches. I'm going to give you some background information about those questions in that passage of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians. Paul had been there and he had started some churches and he had taught them some basic doctrines. Later on, people think it's while he was in Corinth, he heard that the Thessalonian churches had become concerned because some of their loved ones had died. So and they, they thought they had missed the rapture. So Paul apparently had taught them about the rapture coming before the tribulation. They were worried that those who had died wouldn't see the return of Jesus. That's when he wrote to them about the rapture. And turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep or which are dead in Jesus will God bring with them. He's going to bring their souls back. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God in the dead, those souls, in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Let me go back for a minute. It says, And the trump of God and the dead, verse 16, in Christ shall rise first. It's their bodies. Their bodies are going to rise up to meet their souls that Christ is bringing with them. 
Okay, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I think that is such a sweet, sweet, sweet thing because those souls of our loved ones (laughs) that are already up there with Jesus, their bodies are going to rise first. They've already been with Jesus, but their bodies are going to rise up to be reunited with their souls. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. To me, that's saying, okay, they've already been up there and they've met Jesus. They're going to be with you when you meet him. They're going to be with you in the air when you meet him. They're going to go first to meet with us in the air, to meet Jesus. You know, when you have a new baby, you want to be the first to show it to everybody. I think it's kind of the same way. Those, our loved ones, their souls that are already in heaven, they've been with Jesus for all these years. They are going to be caught up together with us to introduce us to our Lord. I think that's just so sweet. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. And while I'm here to to uh, showing you this, I I got to show you something else. I got to show you something else. Paul said, "Comfort one another." Well, part of the comfort is that we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. We're going to be delivered from the tribulation. Look in the same letter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 through 10. Uh, He's saying, People have heard how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Because of this scripture and other scriptures, I believe the double application is that He has delivered us from the wrath of hell, but also from the wrath of God's judgment during the tribulation that is to come. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, which says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, that's the salvation of our bodies, by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him, wherefore, Again, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. God's not appointed us to any kind of wrath. Our souls have salvation now that, uh, now, our souls have salvation now, and our bodies are going to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus when He comes at the rapture. Romans eight twenty three says, we have the Spirit in us, but we groan waiting for the redemption or the salvation of our bodies. I'm going to get a new body, <laughs> one that does not wake up with aches and pains. Paul told them to comfort themselves with those thoughts. How comforting would it be to think you had to go through the tribulation first? I'm afraid all my focus would be right there on the tribulation. I'm afraid I'd get my focus off of the good things to come. (laughs) Revelation 3.10, to the Philadelphia church, God said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.13 lets us know that statement. Is the Spirit talking to all the churches, not just the one at Philadelphia? He is going to keep us from that hour of trial, from that hour of wrath. Now, I can see the church briefly in chapter 5, verses 9 through 14. Chapter 5 of Revelation. But in Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17... With the opening of the first seals, it says the great day of his wrath is come. After the history of the church is given, 
with the word church and churches being mentioned over and over. I counted 13 times, but I think I read 17 times. The, the church is mentioned in Revelation 1 through 3. It is mentioned no more after the come up hither in chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation until Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 at the marriage of the Lamb and then us coming back with Him at the second coming in verse 14. Chapter 6 through 18, no mention of the church while the horrible things of the tribulation are going on. My belief is that Christ has gone through all of the wrath of God that he's going to go through when he took our sins on himself at the cross. The church is the body of Christ. We learned that in our Ephesian study. And the body of Christ, Christ is not going to go through any part of the tribulation. Him on the cross. Now, okay, the first letter helped them for a while, but when they got worried again because they were coming under a lot of persecution, the beginning of sorrows we talked about last week in Matthew 24, 1 through 8. Uh, so once again, they thought, oh man, we've missed the rapture and we're in the tribulation. <laughs> also, a false letter had been circulated as if it were from Paul, but it wasn't. So they just didn't know what to believe. Paul must, he must have taught them earlier that the rapture would come first because if they thought they had to go through the tribulation or even some part of it, then they would have been rejoicing that, oh man, Jesus is coming soon. But they were thinking they had missed the rapture and they were left behind to endure the tribulation. So in the second letter to them, Paul writes to assure them they have not been left behind and they are not in the tribulation. The troubles they were going through were real troubles, but not anything like the troubles of the tribulation will be. Likewise, today, we go through troubles and other countries are going through more horrible, horrible troubles than we are, but still, it's nothing like the tribulation is going to be. So now, let's look at what Paul writes to reassure them. And this is the same scripture that, that many, including myself, have not understood correctly. Our questions were, will the Holy Spirit still be around? And can people who have heard the gospel in the church age get saved during the tribulation? Well, I'm about to try and answer those questions for you. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll begin at verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as for us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying, I beg you, don't get so upset when you hear these false rumors because when Jesus comes, we're going to be gathered together with him. We're going to be with him. I would be shaken in every which way if I thought I was in the tribulation. So that's what they were thinking. So to me, Paul is telling them, we'll, we're going to be gathered together with him when that time comes. So don't believe it. If someone tells you he's already come, whether it's a spirit or, or if it comes in a letter. Now remember, they think they're in the tribulation and that they've missed the rapture. But in 2 Thessalonians 2.3, Paul starts telling them that some things have to happen first that haven't happened yet. There's going to be a falling away. That falling away is apostasy. It means a departure from the teachings of Christianity. And we can see that happening. It's happening day by day. And then Second Thessalonians 2 verses 3 through 5 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, 
the tribulation, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? He says, I've already told you this before, and now I'm telling you again. He's trying to tell them they don't have to worry because they're not going to be around then, because if they were in the tribulation, this man of sin would have been revealed by now. The book of Daniel teaches that the Antichrist during the middle of the tribulation is going to go in the Jewish temple and exalt himself and demand to be worshipped as God. But before this happens, something else will happen that will cause so many to really believe his lies. Verse 6 of Second Thessalonians 2. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who is he? He is the man of sin from verse 3 the son of perdition. He's being held back right now. It's not his time yet. Although the mystery of iniquity is already at work, Satan's been working overtime since the Garden of Eden, and he's still working in Paul's day and in ours. But before he's revealed as Antichrist sitting in the temple to receive worship, something else has to happen to make it believable that he really might be God in the flesh in the first three and a half years, the man of sin is a peaceful man that everyone loves. Satan's using this man. But what is going to happen is that he's going to be taken out of the way. It's not the Holy Spirit that's taken out, as many have taught. It's the man of sin that's taken out. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Okay, some have taught and have made the he in verse 7 to be the Holy Spirit, but it may not be. And some versions have even capitalized he in verse 7 so that it appears to be the Holy Spirit that's taken out of the way because of the rapture. Well, yes, the church will be gone, and yes, the Holy Spirit in the body of believers will be gone, so that could be one way to interpret it, although the Holy Spirit won't be gone except in the body of believers. The Holy Spirit is still going to be around because God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and fills the heaven and the earth. The Holy Spirit is not going to be taken out of anybody's way. <laughs> he will still be very active on this earth during the tribulation. Satan has always tried to imitate everything God does. So it's not surprising that during the tribulation, he will show up as a trinity in the satanic trinity, which we see in Revelation chapter 13. The dragon is unseen and invisible. He represents himself as the father, the anti-God. And then we see the beast who is the son of perdition. He is the anti-Christ. And then the false prophet is the anti-spirit. So we have God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the satanic trinity. There are verses for that, many other verses. Another lesson right now we're talking about if people will be saved in the tribulation and if the Holy Spirit's still at work. During the tribulation, the Satan is going to be using a man just like he used Judas during the first three and a half years um, of Christ's ministry. Remember, Judas was called the, the son of perdition. This guy will be everything... The world system has always wanted. He's going to be a peacemaker. He's going to flatter people. Everyone is going to love him. But around the middle of the, th the seven-year tribulation, he's going to be killed. He's going to be taken out of the way so that the wicked can be revealed. Satan is already at work. The mystery of iniquity is at work right now, but he can only go as far as God will let him. God is withholding him 
now. But after the church is gone, he's going to be turned loose on planet Earth. Before we go up in the rapture, we may have a clue as to who the man of sin is, but it's after we're gone that he will be revealed. And and then in mid-trib, he will be revealed as to who he really is, the man Satan uses. The first half of the tribulation will be taken out by a mortal head wound, and Satan the Antichrist will be revealed. And the Jews are going to know what to do and where to run to from Matthew 24. We studied that a couple of weeks ago. Verse 7 of Second Thessalonians 2, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. The man Satan has been using is going to be killed. After that, the man of sin will be revealed in his complete character as the Antichrist. A mortal head wound, Revelation 13.3. And then he will be resurrected, most likely three days later, because Satan always imitates Jesus. And then the man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan's seed of Genesis 3.15 will be revealed for who he truly is, the Antichrist. It's at this time that the dragon, who is Satan, will fully, fully indwell this man, the Antichrist. We're going to stop there for today because I'm thinking that's about all you can take in. <laughs> Next week we will continue the study and uh, I will finish answering the questions for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your holy word that does not leave us in the dark but helps us to understand and to know the things that are going to happen in the last days so we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be shaken in spirit or trouble, Lord. We know you got us. You got the church, and you're going to take us up to be with you, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Help us, Lord, to be telling people. Help us to be telling people so that they won't be left behind. We love you, Lord Jesus, but we want to love you more. In Christ's name I pray. Amen off last week with the man Satan has been using, has been taken out of the way by a mortal head wound. And at that time, the dragon, who is Satan, will fully indwell the man. Revelation 13, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Oh my, they think he is just wonderful. This happens three and a half years into the tribulation. But then all hell breaks loose on earth. Up until this time, Satan has influence, but now he's given free reign for a while. His ministry is three and a half years long. Great imitator, just like the ministry of Christ was three and a half years long. So the strong delusion, the strong delusion is coming and people are going to believe the lie because right now they've already chosen to believe the lie. But if in their heart they start seeking God, the true God, they can still be saved. So in Revelation chapter 12, Satan was cast out of heaven. Verses 10 and 12, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Remember when he came before God and accused Job. Well, I suppose he does us that same way. And Jesus retained the scars in his hand to show the Father. He's our advocate. He retained those scars to show the Father. I've taken care of that. It's covered. Thank Jesus. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 8 through 10. And then shall that wicked be revealed, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 11 says, God shall send them strong delusion 
that they should believe a lie. Whoa, Satan is going to be a strong, strong delusion and deceiver. Look at Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. So it could be that the man of sin being used by Satan is the one taken out in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and not the Holy Spirit that is taken out. And when Satan is revealed in Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation, he is going to be so convincing that the people will believe his lies. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The deceivableness and the strong delusion would match Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 through 14, the great wonders that he deceived them with on earth, with all the miracles. Remember how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We studied that God squeezed Pharaoh's heart until what was deep inside finally came to the surface and he made a once and for all decision against God. Well, there's going to be some squeezing going on during the tribulation. I believe these people in the tribulation still have a choice. God doesn't make them believe Satan's lies, but he's not going to prevent them from believing them either if that's what they want to do. He will allow it to happen, and he won't withhold Satan then as he does now. So just think, right now, people believe, unsaved people, they believe or, or um, they blame God, for everything that happens, every single thing that happens, they blame God for it. Don't you think when all of the horrible things are going on on the earth during the tribulation, they're going to blame God big time. And God will send them strong delusion. He will let them. God cast Satan down to earth in chapter 12. But in our age, God prevents Satan from some things and only lets him go so far. But in the tribulation, Satan will be seen in all his ugliness. And the false prophet will be so convincing with his miracles. And a lot of those who didn't find it in their hearts to love God's ways while they were in the good old church age sure aren't going to love God's ways in the tribulation period. So, when the really bad stuff is happening, they're not just going suddenly, oh, I love God and I love God's ways. No, some will, some will. But those who have already heard, um, many of them will believe the lie, sad to say. But there's going to be a great, great multitude of people that, that will believe. Second Thessalonians 2, 10 through 11 doesn't say when it is that these people have heard and refused to be saved. I think it's before and after the rapture that they hear and that they have a chance to be saved. But notice that if it were so that the strong delusion is what caused them to believe the lies, the strong delusion doesn't happen until the middle of the tribulation period. They would still have the first three and a half years to get saved. To believe the Holy Spirit is not still at work during the tribulation is inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. Because look with me in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The 144,000 Jews, there's 12,000 from each tribe, they get saved very early on in the tribulation. It appears Revelation 14.4 says they're the first fruits, if I'm understanding this correctly. So how and why would they have gotten saved unless they'd already heard the gospel preached before the rapture? It will be these Jewish missionaries who are going to go out and witness to the next group of people. 
But now if I am wrong about when these people get saved and sealed, um, it doesn't matter because there's still going to be a whole bunch of people saved during the tribulation. I'm not sure if they got saved early on or not, but my understanding is that they did. But like I say, be like the Bereans. Go back and search the scripture for yourself. Okay, so these Jewish missionaries, the Jews are going to be the light, light to the world then in the tribulation period. They're finally, finally going to shine like they were supposed to somewhat. So they're witnessing to the next group of people we see in Revelation 7, 9 through 17. A great multitude from all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes. This is not, this is not the church. This is Gentiles saved during the tribulation. There's a multitude that have been saved during the tribulation that cannot be numbered. This group of people have palms in their hands. The church in Revelation 4 had crowns in their hands until we cast them at the feet of Jesus in Revelation 7:14, these people have washed their own robes with their works. They were martyred. In Revelation 1:5, it says Jesus washed us in his own blood. The church does not have to wash our robes or anything else once Jesus has washed us. So Revelation 7, 9 through 17. A great multitude from all nations that cannot be numbered. I mean, I know there's some people right now living in the world who have not heard the gospel. A few um, tribes way off somewhere, but not a great multitude from all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. These are people saved during the tribulation. The 144,000 Jews at the first of Revelation 7, 1 through 8, well, they're not the church. It clearly tells you they're not the church. The text states clearly who these people are. They're Jews. For more proof that they're not the church in Revelation 14, 1 through 4, they're called virgins with the S, plural. The church is always referred to as a virgin, singular, a chaste virgin. Check out 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Another reason we know these two groups of people in Revelation 7 is not the church is that they're two separate groups. One group is Jews in verse 1 through 8, and in verses 9 through 17, we see another group, which are Gentiles in the church. We just studied in Ephesians and Galatians, there is no Jew or Gentile in the church, no male or female. We are all just one in the body of Christ, one. But here in this chapter, Revelation 7, a difference is made between the two. The only place I see the church in the book of Revelation is in chapters 1 through 3. We go up in chapter 4. We're seen around the throne in chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. And we're not seen again until we come back down with Jesus in chapter 19. So in chapter 6 through 18, while the tribulation is going on on earth from the first seal to the last trumpet, you don't see the church. To believe the Holy Spirit is not at work during the tribulation is inconsistent with the scriptures we've looked at and with a lot of scriptures that we haven't looked at. It's inconsistent with the love and mercy of God because he's not willing that any should perish. So he keeps giving chance after chance after chance after chance But there comes a time when a person has to make that final decision to receive the truth or not. The reason people perish in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 10 through 12 is that they don't receive the gospel message. It doesn't say when they didn't receive it. They're deceived because they don't believe, period. 
Our God is love. The purpose of the tribulation is to bring the nation of Israel back to God and to judge sin on this earth. Finally, finally, sin on this earth is going to be judged. People get away with a lot of stuff right now, but one day that's all going to be over. And um, during that time, people are going to have to make a once and for all decision one way or another, either to believe on God, believe on Jesus or not. In the last chapter of Revelation, people are still being begged to be saved. Anyone that is a thirst, let him come and take of the water of life freely. A lot of things God cannot and will not make crystal clear to us because we don't have what it takes in a shit to deal with it. If we knew exactly what heaven is like, I think we'd probably all, uh, we've all had dark moments that, that we'd just soon kill ourselves and go on and be with Jesus. I think Satan sent them dark moments into all of our lives. If some people knew for certain that they'd have a chance to get saved after the rapture, they'd keep putting off salvation. They'd keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. So some things in the Bible are kind of vague, but I believe if we really want an answer enough to pray and search for it in his word, I believe he will reward us with that answer. So if you really want to know, if you really want to know the answer, be like who? <laughs> the Bereans. I say it every Sunday in my class. Be like the Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was so. I may be wrong. A lot of times on my YouTube videos, I, I, I make a mistake and say the wrong thing, but I don't know how to trim it and edit it. <laughs> so I just let it go. Just be like the Bereans. Search the scripture for yourself. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you do give us chance after chance after chance to come to you. Thank you, Lord, for, for that. And Lord, I pray that if one is listening that does not know you, that today would be the day they come to you in belief that they would turn from their sin and turn to you in belief as the one who died rose again and paid the price for their sins. So simple, so simple, Lord Jesus. I'm going to tell them in my prayer to you, if you're listening, just say, Lord, I believe on you. Please be my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name I pray, amen.